Good morning, Promise Church. All righty, before we begin with uh, worship, uh, can we just take this time to really uh, set our hearts before God? Will you bow with me? Lord Father, we thank you for uh, just this beautiful day and just with everybody gathered here just to worship under one name. Lord, thank you for being that loving Father, Lord, just to send your Son to die on that cross for us, Lord, while we are still sinners. Lord, I just pray that as we uh, have this time of worship, God, that we may just reflect and truly just be Lift your name up, Lord, because you are worthy, God. You just be with us in this time. Amen. May we all stand. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. See you high and lift it up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy
your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy.
be seated at this time. through your word. I pray that uh, you just speak through our guest speaker, Pastor Tom. Um, would you just use him as a vessel? I just pray that you just open our hearts ready to receive, Lord. Um, we just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, good morning, Promise Church. Uh, thank you guys for joining us today. I want to dismiss the children to their Sunday school first. All right, if you're new here today, uh, you're a special guest, uh, so if you can fill out it, if you want to, you can fill out a connect card, drop it off in the back, and we will get in touch with you that way. If you're online, uh, click on the new here on the website, and we will get in touch with you that way. Uh, today, 
is norm the first Sunday of the month is normally communion Sunday, but uh, we are postponing it to next Sunday. So next Sunday will be communion Sunday. And our first announcement today is going to be membership class. And if you are interested in becoming a member here at the Promise Church, uh, we do have our next membership class next Sunday from 1.15 to 5.30 at the church loft. It's just a couple blocks away from here. And even if you attend, you're not obligated to become a member. Uh, you can just come to find out uh, what our mission is, what we believe, and what our values are. And so you're not, in no way obligated to become a member if you do come. And so if you want to sign up for that, please uh, reply to our email, or you, can apply, or you can fill out the insert today in your bulletin. And next up is Operation Christmas Child. Uh, so this year, we're going to be participating in that again. And um, it's just an outreach to bless the children across the world with uh, the, a shoebox full of items. And so there are a list of suggested items in the box um, that you can pick one up in the back. And I also believe that some of the community groups uh, will be participating in this as well. So please talk with your leader. And so the last day to drop off the pack boxes is November 20th at the church or November 21st at a drop off location. And lastly, we have uh, our announcements, community groups. And so uh, those are um, Bible studies and uh, fellowship and a time to just do life on life together. They're a great way to get plugged in here at the Promise Church. And uh, we currently have four groups. So if you're interested, uh, you can fill out a uh, connect card or you can talk to one of the leaders after service today. And I'd like to invite Daniel up to welcome the speaker today. Thanks, Hanson. Morning, church. All right, so I'm going to be introducing our guest speaker today. Uh, so this is Tom McMillan. Uh, Tom is a graduate of UC Davis and has served on the staff of crew with his wife, Jessica, for 10 years. Tom and Jessica have four daughters uh, who are seven, five, three, and one, Mabel, Gwen, Agnes, and Opal. He has served in ministry reaching college students at UC Davis in Port Elizabeth, South Africa, and for the last six years in the Inland Empire. Currently, he leads Crew's Inland Empire team, which helps share the gospel with college students in Riverside and San Bernardino counties. So uh, we all give Tom a warm welcome, and thanks for coming, Tom. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, as Daniel said, my name is Tom McMillan, and it, it's a huge honor and a privilege to be able to share God's word with you today. And uh, yeah, as Daniel said, I've served with Crew for the last 10 years. Some of you guys might know Zach and Corey Park. Uh, so they're, they're dear friends of mine. We served on the same team for a number of years. Uh, we led the team together. And uh, when uh, my family, my wife Jessica and I moved here to Riverside back in 2016, we actually checked out the Promised Church for, for a couple weeks. Uh, we knew about it through Zach and that's how we got connected to, to Pastor Roy. And so, yeah, it's, it's really been a, a blessing to see um, the faithful ministry of the Promised Church uh, throughout the years. And because I serve in ministry helping reach college students, it's awesome to see the Promise's impact. And I know it goes beyond this, but the impact on the college campus with college students. Maybe we have some AA students in the house. Maybe, maybe not, I guess. Yeah, so, but uh, yeah, a few here, and I, and I know even beyond UCR students, with, you know, I'm sure there's graduate and medical students that have been served, and, um, and God has had an impact with this church beyond the college campus as well. So it's, yeah, it's, it's just a huge privilege to be here. Uh, our passage this morning is Joel 2, 12 through 17. So you can start turning there if you have your Bibles. Uh, and I, it's also going to be on the screen. We're going to read it in a moment. Um, and man, what a remarkable series I get to join you for. I don't recall ever hearing a sermon or, or a series in the book of Joel before, but as I've listened through and read through some of what Pastor Roy has shared with you all over the last few weeks, God has really drawn me in to the message of this book. And I think Pastor Roy, he's made it alive and really fresh to me. Um, so let's, let's uh, read our passage this morning and ask for God's help to understand it. So yeah, Joel 2, 12 through, uh, through 17. This is God's word. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. And he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, 
Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Let me pray and ask for God's help. Father, your word is powerful. Your word does not return void, and so we ask you that you would speak to us this morning. And we ask you that you... um, you would show us what's in our hearts. You'd show us where we need to turn to you. Show us where we need to believe the gospel more. And Father, um, we pray that you would make our hearts tender to receive your message to us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, well, hey, I know Pastor Roy has preached a few times probably on the day of the Lord, because it happens in chapter one, happens in chapter two again. And one of the things that I appreciated he shared was that as we face these crises in our life, uh, they can almost be like these little days with the Lord that, that become this rehearsal for that great day of the Lord to, to come. And when I was a freshman in college, I remember such a day for myself. So one of my classes was a film studies class. It was an elective. It was one of those classes, I don't think it even counted for gen ed. It was just like, I got to college. I can't take this in high school. I can take it here in college now, so I might as well, right? And I'll be the first to admit to, that I was not the best student in this class. So I, I, I right away found out that hey, you can skip classes and nothing will happen to you, right? It's not, attendance is not part of the grade. This is different from, from high school. And the structure of the grade in this class was 30% midterm, 30% final, 40% term paper. And while I was taking this class, something else exciting happened. I met my future wife, Jessica. We began dating. And one fateful evening, I got to my film viewing lab 15 minutes late because I had been on a date with Jessica. It was very enjoyable. Um, but I missed something really crucial in that first 15 minutes of the class, right? I missed the reminder that the final term paper was due the next morning. And what did I do the next morning? I skipped the lecture. So a few weeks later, I'm sitting in just the normal lecture for this class, and the professor starts remarking, hey, we've got your term papers, we're working on them, they're starting to look really good, my grader's working really hard, we'll get your grades out to you soon. And I just have this, the, just like the pit in my stomach dro- drops as I realized what had likely happened. And man, the day of the Lord had come upon me, or it felt like it, right? And I, I approached the professor after class, I was shaking, and he told me, and he was very clear about this, I don't take late work. So no late work, right? And Man, I was an AP student in high school. This was a situation, nothing like this had ever happened to me. This truly felt hopeless. 40% of my grade in that class was just gone, and there was nothing I could do about it. Right? Some of you are feeling that right now. You're like, oh, yeah, it's like <laughs> so close to finals. Like, I hope that doesn't happen to me. It won't, right? But um, now think of where Joel's audience is at this point in the book, right? So they all already faced that devastating plague of locusts, and that exposed them likely to severe famine, right? It's really bad. Now there's another day of the Lord, and this one is an invading army from the north. This army is so powerful and destruction, destructive, it says they're turning Eden into a wasteland behind them. It's like they're undoing creation itself. They're destroying everything in their wake. Cities don't stand a chance against their sieges, and their path is headed straight to Jerusalem. And then... In chapter 2, verse 11, we find out the most terrifying part of this situation. This is the Lord's army. God is the commander of this army. And it says, The Lord utters his voice before his army. His camp is exceedingly great. He who executes his word is powerful. For the day of the Lord is great and very awesome. Who can endure it? So this is truly a hopeless situation. The sovereign, holy God is leading a powerful army straight to Jerusalem's doorstep because of their sin and unfaithfulness. They deserve the day of judgment that's coming. Nothing can stop him. Who can endure that? Yet, even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. 
Three earth-shattering words break through that hopelessness. Yet, even now. Even in his people's worst moment, at their furthest from him, with an army at the very gates, it wasn't too late to return to God. In fact, the same voice that drove this unstoppable army relentlessly forward now makes a firm declaration. And this is the only time in the book that it says, declares the Lord. And this declaration tells his people and invites them to return. And as we face crises in our lives and in the world, those three words stand. Yet, even now, we can return to God with our whole hearts. And as we'll discover from our passage today, God relents of disaster. He's a God who's merciful. He's a sovereign God who works to get our attention, not to condemn us, but to turn our hearts to him. There's a beautiful invitation in this passage to return and repent wherever you might find yourself. The God who relents invites his people to return to him. That's our big idea this morning. The God who relents invites his people to return to him. So I want to break down this passage into four sections and explore how we should respond to God's invitation to return. All right, so if you take notes, you can write these down. You don't need to. They're going to be on the screen. Return with all your heart. Return with faith in his saving promises. Return in community with God's people. And return by making God's glory central. So let's start. First, return with all your heart. This is verses 12 and 13. Um, let's, let's read those again. Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning, and rend your hearts and not your garments. So returning with our whole hearts, it means a total reorientation towards the Lord. And the language of the whole heart recalls Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, uh, which is what Jesus calls the the greatest commandment, and the Jewish people call the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord your God is one. You shall worship the Lord your God with all your heart and love, uh, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your might. All your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your might. This is another way of saying we should love God with our whole selves, right? A hundred percent of our lives and our devotion belongs to the Lord. And that was true of the people of Israel, right? 100% of their lives and of their devotion was supposed to go to Yahweh, the only true God. Uh, But the constant temptation, both for Israel and for us, is to turn from the one God. And we give our love elsewhere, right? Even if it's just a little bit of our heart, a little bit of our soul, of our mind, of our might. Ancient Israel, they lived in a climate that that depended greatly upon rain, for agriculture and drinking water. And I mean, that sounds familiar, right? We depend upon snowpack for our water in California. But they didn't have irrigation systems. They didn't have water projects, right? They were really dependent upon that rain. And at times, they were tempted to offer a little bit of their devotion to other gods who claimed authority over the rains and over storms, over fertility of crops and animals and different things like that. They couldn't trust in Yahweh 100% to provide. So they gave a little worship here, a little worship there, right? But this is not acceptable to the one true God. He doesn't do diversified portfolios, right? He demands all of our life, all of our loyalty, all of our love, right? And we we probably don't feel tempted to worship a storm God, most of us. I mean, there is a drought going on, right? But, um, But we have a lot of trouble offering our whole devotion to God, right? We just sang a song about that, right? Give us clean hands, give us pure hearts, Right? Let's, let's, let's lift up our souls to God alone. We tend to find security in, in the things we have, in the things we do, in the things people say about us and think about us, right? So we give a little worship to achievements. We give a little worship to, to grades, a little worship to our material goods. And we also give worship to God alongside of these things, right? Not only is idolatry like that wrong, it's fruitless. It doesn't work. It's not going to bring you life. It's not going to bring you joy. Idols never prove faithful in the end, 
right? It says in God's word, those who make them become as lifeless as the idols they worship. So we gotta return with our whole hearts and that means first devoting 100% of your trust, your love, and your life to the one God and 0% to idols. Now how do you know, you know if, you're, if you have an idol in your life? You can think of your, your heart uh, as having rooms and maybe these rooms represent different areas of your life. Maybe one ep- represents your career, one represents your, your family, your relationships, one represents you know, maybe your sexuality, one represents your, your uh, material goods that you own. Now imagine Jesus coming into that, that house of your heart, right? Would there be any rooms you would scramble to be like, dude, I'm locking that door, right? Jesus doesn't come into that area. I don't want him to see that. Maybe it's too messy. Maybe I don't want him rearranging and reorganizing. That could point to an idol, right? That could point to an area of your life where maybe 100% is not going to God, right? Now, returning, as this verse, verse uh, 13 points to, it also requires contrition, Genuine sorrow and remorse over our sin, not just outward actions, right? So verse 13 says, rend your hearts and not your garments. Now backing up a little bit to verse 12, there's a very traditional formula for uh, lament in the Old Testament, right? Fasting, weeping, mourning, and tearing or rending of clothing, right? So people crying out to God in great crisis and mourning, repentance, they would tear their clothes They would put on scratchy garments called sackcloth. They would even throw dust and ashes on their heads and just cry out to God, right? So for example, the people of Nineveh respond exactly in this way when Jonah warns that God's about to destroy that city in 40 days. Um, Joel, he doesn't condemn these external displays of remorse, but he maintains the condition of our hearts is more important than the condition of our clothing. In the words of one commentator, outward manifestations there will be, but they must be symbols of a broken heart, a will fully yielded to God's demands. I've been married uh, for for a little over 10 years, uh, and I have found myself in hot water many, many times, right, Trying trying to repair a relationship. And the way that I've gone about doing that has evolved a lot over the years. So what I learned from TV shows as a kid was you gotta buy flowers, you gotta buy jewelry, you gotta come with some other kind of gift. But when I came with these gifts to say I'm sorry, the reply back was usually, sorry for what? And as you could expect, I didn't usually nail that answer, right? Um, My heart was not attuned enough to know how I had let her down, you know, where I had really hurt her. So I had external displays of remorse, I had outward actions, but I didn't truly have a broken heart, right? Now, years later, you know, I still find myself in hot water, um, and I find myself at times with a broken heart, but without the appropriate actions that should flow from that heart, right? Maybe not seeing, not seeing the change that should flow from that. So I, I have a, a demonstration of contrition without a demonstration at times of the will to change in certain things. God sees through our external actions. He sees right into our heart, and he desires a broken heart. Psalm 51 tells us, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart you will not despise. And from that broken and contrite heart should flow that total reorientation towards the Lord. But, you know, I want to distinguish this broken heart from the self-condemnation and self-hatred some of us may struggle with. St. Paul tells a church that's well-versed in unfaithfulness to God. He says, a godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, but a worldly grief produces death. A grief over sin that drives us away from God is not from God. That's a worldly grief producing death, despising ourselves, hating ourselves, harboring a low view of yourself. That's not the same thing as humility. That's not the broken, contrite heart that God requires of us. So some of you may know the context of Psalm 51. So King David wrote that psalm, right? And he is repenting over his adultery with Bathsheba, a woman that he, he spied bathing on the roof, right? Right? And he, he commits adultery with her, and they conceive a child. 
to cover his tracks, he murders her husband, right? And then as a result of God's judgment over that sin, the child they conceived dies. It's, it's a crisis, right? It's this, this is a terrible thing. And if anyone would have a reason to hate themselves, it would be him. And yet the promise of God and Holy Scripture comes from the mouth of this sinful king, a broken and contrite heart, you will not despise. Godly sorrow leads us into the arms of Jesus to receive mercy, salvation without regret, right? Have you ever sinned in a really heinous way and then thought, man, I should really improve my record a while before I read my Bible. I should, I should do better before I go to God in prayer and ask for his help. I need to walk consistently with God to deserve the love that he shows me. Or have you just beat yourself up with terrible thoughts after sinning? The good news It's by Jesus' wounds we're healed, not by yours. So we should stop punishing ourselves after we sin. Rending our hearts means returning to God with a sorrowful heart, agreeing we've sinned, agreeing in Christ we're forgiven, and agreeing to turn back towards God's ways. He will not despise us. And the next section of our text gives us all the more confidence to say that. So point number two, we should return to God with faith in his saving promises. So let's look at verses, uh, second half of verse 13 and verse 14. It says, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. From Genesis to Revelation, God reveals himself as a God of yet even now. He has always planned redemption for his people. And throughout scripture, he has made clear his promises to save through his covenants with his people. Now, what is a covenant? So a covenant is an agreement that a great figure makes unilaterally with the lesser figure. And then both sides agree to face consequences if they break this covenant. One theologian famously compared the book of Deuteronomy to ancient treaties that are in the ancient Near East where kings would conquer people and then make these treaties with them, um, with the nations that they defeated and set out the terms for that relationship. And through his self-giving love, mercy and saving work, God has conquered us. He's conquered his people and he swears his promise to us to uphold us to the end. And verses 13 and 14 They contain the heart of God's saving promise, his covenant with Israel. It's the definitive statement of his covenant love, and we find that in Exodus 34. So context of Exodus 34, Moses has returned from receiving the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, but there's trouble down below. The people sort of grew anxious, they grew afraid. While Moses was up there, they didn't want to wait, and so they asked Aaron to make a golden calf, to make a physical representation of Yahweh. And so he does it. Um, And they're bowing down to this golden calf, and they're saying, behold, your God who delivered you from Egypt. And so this is is really bad. This is not what God wants. Um, And so the Lord tells Moses, I'm going to destroy this people, and I'm going to start over with you. And thankfully, Moses intercedes for the people, and the Lord doesn't destroy Israel, right? In the midst of this episode... Moses asked God to reveal his glory to him, and he does. He hides him in a cleft of rock, and it, and it passes before him. It says, passes before him with all his goodness. And he cries out his name, the essence of his glory and his character. And this is what God says. The Lord, or Yahweh, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. When we, when we hear these words in this text, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, and this is referencing this great, great covenant text in Exodus 34. This is like the, this is like the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. This is like the Ephesians 2.8 and 9 of the Old Testament. So you always got to go back there when you hear it. And uh, we could preach numerous sermons just on those key words, right? And we don't have time for that. 
but let's unpack some of them. So God's gracious. One commentary defines gracious as the favor and complete goodwill of a superior party who condescends to one who is inferior. <clears throat> now God, he's seated far above. His glory is beyond all. He's holy. Psalm 113 says he looks far down on the inhabitants of the earth. And yet, Psalm 113, it continues right after that. It says he also dwells down in the dust with the poor and needy, and he raises them to sit uh, from the ash heap to sit with princes. So condescending, it doesn't mean God's rude. It doesn't mean he's like, you know, he thinks he's better than us, although he is better than us. It means that the holy God comes to us in our broken need, our brokenness in our need. Merciful. Okay, merciful implies fatherly and motherly care, that God's anxious for the life of his children. Right? Psalm 103, verse 13 says, as a father shows compassion on his children, so the Lord shows compassion on those who fear him. Slow to anger means God's patient. He's patient when he's offended. He's not like some of those we know, you know, who we have to walk on eggshells around them because they're just easily set off and you don't know uh, what's going to set them off. God is slow to anger. His steadfast love, his has said, it's that faithful covenant love that sticks with his people no matter what. And we could go on and on about these characteristics, but hopefully it's easy to see that in light of God's character, he relents over disaster. It's what he does. Uh, he, he turns from his judgments when his people turn back to him. And that relenting, it flows directly from his grace, mercy, and steadfast love. We, we see this really clearly in the book of Jonah, um, that also ties relenting to God's character and to this covenant passage. So God calls Jonah to go and preach to Nineveh, which is the capital city of Israel's enemy, Assyria, which is really a, a terrible, terrible empire. Um, and Jonah refuses to go, not because, as you might think, he's afraid. He's afraid he might get uh, you know, killed or might get thrown in prison. Maybe reasons we wouldn't want to go preach in the Middle East or something like that. That's not it. Actually, in chapter 4, Jonah tells God exactly why he refused to go. But Jonah 4.2, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. So Jonah didn't want to go because he knew God would relent. He knew God would forgive them, and he wanted that city, Nineveh, to burn. He was angry at God's love and mercy for Israel's enemies. And the amazing thing, God didn't even have a covenant with Assyria, far from it, right? They weren't his chosen people. But Jonah was absolutely confident that God would relent from his judgment on Assyria because of the kind of God he is. Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And there's another strong connection uh, to Jonah in our passage. So as we look at verse 14 um, in Joel, that comes almost directly from the mouth of the king of Assyria in Joel 3, in Jonah 3. Upon hearing Jonah's sermon, which is really stripped down, so yet 40 days and the city will be overthrown, the people from the greatest to the least, they repented in sackcloth and ashes and with fasting. And the king of Nineveh says, who knows? God may turn, may relent and turn from his fierce anger so that we may not perish. Who knows? So who knows? It's a statement of humble hope. Because God is slow to anger, the king of Assyria and Joel both believe in the possibility of God turning from his anger and bringing restoration and healing. But they also reflect, respect the fact that they stand under the judgment of a sovereign God. So how about for us as Christians? Should we also display this humble hope? On this side of the cross, uh, the Bible says we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed. We have what the prophets and the patriarchs waited for and hoped for, but didn't see in their day. And that is Jesus Christ. And in Christ, as far as our sin is concerned, 
who knows, gives way to an unshakable confidence. 1 John 1, 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That we don't have to wonder whether God might accept us if we return to him with our whole hearts. We have his promise in his covenant in Christ. He's faithful to forgive us because he's true to his word. He is just to forgive us because Christ has already paid the penalty for our sins. And he's faithful to cleanse us, creating his new life in us by the power of his Holy Spirit. And yet, alongside Joel and the king of Assyria, we don't really know what's going to happen to our world. We don't know what's going to happen with these crises that we face in our own lives. And in our world, there's the economic, geopolitical instability. There's a global hunger crisis that's sort of looming. There's the climate crisis. We could go on. Our world and our society is hurting. And we stand under the power of a sovereign God. But still, Joel's hope in verse 14, it goes beyond just forgiveness of the people's sins. And he really hopes for the healing of the land. So it says, who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. He knows that the same God that turned Eden into a wasteland has the power to leave that blessing behind him, to bring back the grain and the wine that were cut off, to undo the curse and the desolation of sin upon the land. In a Return of the King, Frodo and Sam are finally able, beyond all hopes, to destroy the Ring of Power in the fires of Mount Doom after three books worth of a perilous, perilous journey, right? And Sam awakes directly from that volcano sequence, and he, he doesn't know where he is. He's on a soft bed, there's dappled sunlight kind of coming through the leaves above him, and there's a sweet smell in the fresh air, and he thinks he's dreaming. And he awakes to discover that the new king is reigning. Frodo's alive. The ring is destroyed. They won. And then Gandalf sort of surprises him from behind. And Sam says, Gandalf, I thought you were dead. But then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What's happened to the world? Our ultimate hope is that our Savior will return to make all things new and everything sad, it will indeed come untrue. And because of the character of God, when we consider the crises we face in our life and the world right now, we can join with Joel and the king of Syria in that humble hope. Who knows? Who knows? So return to the God who relents, the God of yet even now, because of his saving promises. You will find forgiveness, you'll find healing for your heart, and you'll find hope in the midst of the broken world we're living in right now. So in light of that hope, how should, how should we respond? And Joel continues with the call to corporate repentance. So the next point is we should return to God in community with his people. We should return to God in community with his people. Verses 15 and 16. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Consecrate a fast. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. So Pastor Roy, um, he shared this famous quote from C.S. Lewis the other week. We can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists on being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pains. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. No doubt pain as God's megaphone is a terrible instrument. It may lead to final and unrepented rebellion. But it gives the only opportunity that bad man can have for amendment. It removes the veil. It plants the flag of truth within the fortress of the rebel soul. In chapter 2, verse 1, a trumpet announces the day of the Lord. <clears throat> it's that megaphone that gets the attention of Israel's deaf ears. And now, that trumpet blows again to give the opportunity for repentance. God's purpose is not to destroy Israel through this day of the Lord, but to remove the veil 
and to call the rebel home. And because the day of the Lord that Israel faces threatens the whole community, the whole community must assemble to return to God together. No one's excluded, not the elderly, not nursing infants, not even newly married couples on their honeymoons. Everyone must assemble and before God to meet together in corporate prayer and repentance. So this is a big deal. I mean, it's hard to get it's hard to get nursing infants somewhere, right? It's 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 hard to get with your your whole family, right? But it's such a big deal that that that's what has to happen. And you can tell it's a big deal because these verses contain the language of preparation for like a really sacred religious meeting. It says consecrate, right? Consecrate requires abstaining from work, food, even intercourse. And such preparation was necessary for some of the most holy days in the Jewish calendar. So clearly this meeting will be a solemn assembly indeed. And we see a solemn gathering like this in Ezra chapter 9. So Ezra the, the priest, he learns that some of the Jews who returned from exile in Babylon have intermarried with foreign nations, even some of his own highest officials. And this isn't a problem because they were ethnocentric or something. This is a problem because intermarrying in those days, it came with the worship of the foreign deities um, that, that, uh, that those families would have worshipped. So to intermarry meant to intermingle religious practices and loyalties. So Solomon in the Bible, he's a great example of this. He's the guy who built the temple, and yet at the end of his life, because of the many, many women from different foreign nations that he married, he, was, he had altars to all sorts of foreign gods within, uh, within Jerusalem. And so um, when Ezra receives uh, this news, he responds by tearing his clothes, fasting, prayer of confession, all out in public, it's the same formula of lament and mourning that you see here in the book of Joel. Ezra knew that the sins of these officials and other Jews were not just their personal issue between them and God. They were a corporate issue. They reflected the unfaithfulness of God's people to the covenant. God exiled the people of Israel for idolatry and injustice in the first place. So what might he do with these returned exiles if they did the same things that they did before? It was really a threat to the whole community. So Ezra mourns, laments, repents of these sins publicly. And it says that a very great assembly of men, women, and children gathered to him out of Israel. And they joined him in this public repentance. And as a result of this solemn gathering that they had, the people corporately renewed their covenant with God to be faithful to worship him alone. One great truth we need to embrace is that we were saved not just into a personal relationship with God. We were saved into the church of God, into a family. Ephesians 2, it's a great place to look, to look at this. Verses 1 through 10, um, they talk about our vertical reconciliation to God, that we were dead in sin, that God made us alive in Christ, that we're saved by grace through faith, right? Verses 11 through 22 they speak of the horizontal reconciliation of Jew and Gentile together to God. It says that the cross brings us, that brings us near as individuals also brings enemies near to one another and that God reconciles them together to him in one body through the cross and kills the hostility between them. That God creates one new man in place of the two. The church is not just a gathering of individuals that happen to show up here. We're not just the sum of our parts. The church is truly one body. And therefore, we ought to be communal in addition to having that individual relationship with God. So we don't do live and let live in the church. We pursue the good of one another. Like Hebrews says, we stir one another up towards love and good works. We exhort one another every day not for our hearts to not be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. But at times, we tolerate sin that's commonplace in the community we're in. Maybe we don't even see it because it's just so embedded in our worldviews and our values, we don't even notice it. Maybe we let the sin go unaddressed because we have the same temptations ourselves. The Ezra, he labored in this community after the exile for years. And then suddenly, 
there was a news flash that most people, including his own highest officials, were like intermarrying with foreign women. Couldn't it have been everybody knew, but nobody wanted to say anything about it? So let me ask you this. Have you ever not wanted to ask a fellow believer a question because you were afraid they might ask you back, right? How's your marriage going? How's your purity? How are your eyes and your heart? How's your relationship with entertainment and media? How's evangelism going in your life? How's your time in the word? And maybe there's a question that's popping into your mind right now that you would hope somebody wouldn't ask you. If it's a communal weakness, it's easy to sweep it under the rug. And I think that's probably what happened with Ezra's community. And this isn't easy, but God calls us to return corporately, to identify, confess, and overthrow those sins that we tolerate. Maybe that's at the scale of a congregation. Right? Maybe that's the geographic, socioeconomic, or ethnic community you find yourself in. Maybe that's the church in America. And I'm sure at all these levels, there are ways that we're being unfaithful to the Lord that should be addressed and should be repented of. So I work with Crew, that's a U.S. ministry of Campus Crusade for Christ, and there's this story that gets told in our organization of an incredible thing that happened at our staff conference in 1995. So a guest speaker uh, named Nancy DeMoss was speaking there, and she gave a message on pride versus brokenness. Following that message, hundreds of staff began streaming to the microphone to confess their sins, mostly sins against others, uh, others on staff, sins of pride, right, things like that. And uh, it was an incredible thing. They paused the programming, and they just let this thing take, uh, this sort of movement happen. And an HR leader even got up, and he promised no one would be fired as a result of the confessions that they made, right? Most staff had never seen anything like that before, and we have certainly never seen anything like that since. And I don't know if this is connected, but what followed in the next decades from there was incredible, right? There was revivals, there was unprecedented growth on college campuses, unprecedented growth in our ministry around the world, places like China, uh, other, other places like that, that just revival poured out, right? And many other revivals in history began with similar movements of public corporate confession. It's a really beautiful picture, right? It's a really beautiful picture. But in the last few years, I've noticed that when someone brings up a problem or a sin in our communities, it often becomes an opportunity for an argument, often becomes an opportunity for defensiveness and for pride, rather than for repentance. And at times that person, that first person, like the person who comes and tell, tells Ezra about the problem with intermarriage, a lot of times that first person is rejected, it's divisive, right? instead of just joining with them in the confession and the repentance, um, like the people joined Ezra. It starts, this verse starts with the sound of the trumpet, right? And that sound of that trumpet that summons us to communal repentance, it's, it's, it's harsh, it's strident. Like Lewis says, it's a terrible instrument. But we have to believe that's the sound of God's gracious invitation to us, right? God wants us to humble ourselves as his church, to return to him together, to ask for forgiveness together, to turn the right path together. And as I guess today, obviously, I have no idea what those areas of repentance might be, you know, here, but I believe that there's faithful people who do. And so we have to be brave and start conversations as a result of hearing God's word today. Finally, it's only possible to humble ourselves and confess our sins when we live for something bigger, than ourselves. So that brings us to our fourth point. We must return with love for God's glory. This point comes from verse 17. Let's read it together. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep and say, spare your people, O Lord. Make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? We already have confidence to return to God because of his saving promises, right? Point two. And now our passage closes with yet another reason we can confidently return to the God of yet even now. 
It's because it glorifies him to save us. It glorifies him when we do return to him. So let's, let's look at the lament that um, Joel tells the priests to say, right? To spare your people. There's really two things that they appeal to. One is God's ownership of his people. Right? They're your people, your heritage. The other is God's reputation, his glory among the nations surrounding Israel. And if you look at, I mentioned before Moses interceding for the people of Israel after they make the golden calf, he appeals to the exact same thing, God's ownership of his people and God's glory among the nations. So through, through God's saving work, he, he redeemed his people, right? He's the one who brought them out of Egypt. For us, he forgave our sins by the spilling of the precious blood of his son, and he now owns us. He's the king who conquered us by his self-sacrificial love. We belong to him now. We're his property. And that's the first appeal in verse 17. Spare your people, your heritage. If God's property fell into the hands of his enemies, they might assume some bad things that aren't true. They might assume that Yahweh wasn't powerful enough to save. And in Deuteronomy 9, Exodus 32, God tells, Moses tells God, Egypt would claim he wasn't able to bring the people of Israel out into the promised land. That, he, they, that they would claim that God hated his people. And obviously that would bring a lot of shame on this God, right? A lot of disrepute. The surrounding nations would be led to ask, where is their God? Where is their God? God intended Israel to be a testimony to his greatness among the nations. But a devastated Israel would become something else. They would become like a four-letter word in the mouth of the, their neighbors, a reproach on God's character, a byword, as it says. Now, byword, that's, uh, that's not an everyday sort of word, or, uh, but that's a proverb-like saying or question that becomes a way to mock enemies or becomes almost like a proverb of how not to do things, examples not to follow. And some of us may have that family member, maybe it's an uncle, cousin, whoever it might be, who went a little wayward. And then, maybe a little bit unfairly, that family member has become the example of how not to do things. And there may even be some fear that you might turn out like that person. So that family member would be a byword, right? And in the movie Encanto, Tio Bruno, he was that byword. He was the byword in the family Madrigal. Um, and now there might be a four-letter word in your head while you try to get we don't talk about Bruno out of your head or try not to think about it. You already thought about it. It's already there. So Bruno, he didn't fit in, right? These other, these other siblings, they had these perfect magical gifts um, that, that brought a lot of honor to the Madrigal family. And Bruno, he had a magical gift, prophecy, but it, it creeped people out, right? He, he, he was creepy. He was offensive. He was blundering. He wasn't perfect. And so he ran away in shame. And he said, I don't want to mess up my family. So he went and hid in the walls of the house. And the warning to Mirabelle throughout this movie is to not, uh, not deviate from the path of normalcy in her family because if she did, she would become like Bruno. So that was the constant message. Don't be like Bruno. Don't follow his path. Bruno was a proverb of how not to live. He was a byword. And obviously, it would be a terrible thing for God's glory for Israel to be that byword, right, in the mouth of the nations. If he destroyed them in judgment, there wouldn't be any testimony to God's power or faithfulness. And the nations might even say God doesn't exist, right, or impeach his character. Certainly would have had any living witness to the reality of God in the world. Isn't it true, though, that Israel, imperfect as they were, even after they were restored, after they turned to God, and now the church, isn't it true we can still be a byword in the mouth of people who don't believe? Don't many people reject God because of the hypocrisy of religious people, the injustices Christians have done throughout history, the imperfections of our institutions? Are we a reproach to Christ? No, because it's not our perfection and it's not our independence that bring glory to God. It's God's redemptive work, his grace and mercy to save us. 
So when people bring up the injustices, the hypocrisy, the imperfection, the hurts that we have caused, first of all, we can own those. And even we talked about challenging those, right, in the previous point, right? But also we can share about the sinfulness of mankind, the grace of God in Jesus Christ, and we don't deserve what God has given us. Titus 3, 4 through 7, or just 3, 3, 4 and 5, it says, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Nothing brings glory to our God like the amazing work of redemption he has done for us. And so too, in Encanto, the Madrigal family was not more beautiful for having Bruno hidden in its walls. It became more beautiful when it embraced Bruno back into the family with all of his imperfections. God, he continues to forgive and to preserve his church. And as Ephesians 1 says, it's all to the praise of his glorious grace. So do you feel the need to be perfect like Bruno did initially? Or are you happy being an object of God's redemptive mercy? As we make God's glory central, we go further in to the gospel of grace. We realize in the words of Tim Keller, we are far worse than we ever imagined, but far more loved than we could ever dream. Let's conclude. As I took in the words of my film studies professor, the firmness of that standard, I let the reality of my certain D minus sink in. He looked in my eyes. He taught me about mercy. He told me he would give me 100% in the class for all the rest of the grade, um, apart from the final paper. In fact, I didn't even have to show up the rest of the term. He would give me the 60% by grace. And he invited me to take the course again next year. And repeating that course, my new grade would take the place of my failing grade. So it was tough grace, but it was grace all the same. There was hope even then. And through the crises we face, God's word, it comes to us like a megaphone telling us that yet even now, there is still hope. We can return to him with our whole hearts. We can have faith in his saving promise. We can repent together and trust him to heal our communities in the world. And we know that he will continue to rescue to the glory of his great name. With an absolute certainty in the grace that forgives our sins and heals our hearts. And who knows? God may even deliver our world in the years to come from some of the crises we face. But whether he rescues us from the challenges we face today or not, we know that when Jesus returns, he'll make us and the, new, and, and the world new again. Maybe there's some way God's calling you to return today in some aspect of your life. And I want to point you back to those three sweet words at the beginning of this passage. Yet, even now. God invites you to return to him. You are not too far from his grace. You can't outrun him. You have no reason to fear his rejection and every reason to expect his embrace. So let's pray. And the worship team will come up as I close. Father, it's a, it's a heavy passage, but a beautiful passage we read today. We confess that we have sinned against you many times. We, we turn from you. We give our loves to, to idols that are not worthy of our love in our life. Sometimes we get stuck in feelings of failure, self-pity. We struggle with the challenges we face in our lives in the world. We wonder why. We wonder where are you? And somehow, this doesn't make sense, but we sometimes feel like it would make more sense to run from you in these times instead of running into your arms. Give us grace this morning to turn to you, to believe in the saving promise you've given us in your son, Jesus Christ, to confront our failures and our challenges, believing that there is hope because you are a God of mercy and grace. Thank you, O oh Lord, for what you've shown us in your word this morning. To your name be the glory. Amen. May you all rise for final worship.
make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Go in peace. Oh